Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Jumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. <laughs> The Chumba Life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hi, everyone. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Welcome to Yoga Birth Babies, a podcast produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. We will be diving into everything prenatal yoga, birth, and baby-related, hoping to inspire, educate, and empower you through your journey into motherhood. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Deb Blaschenberg. I'm your host for Yoga Birth Babies, and today we're going to talk about sex after baby. I have Deborah Pascali Bonero here. She is a world-renowned inspirational speaker, a filmmaker, a doula trainer, childbirth educator, and author. And Deborah's latest book, it's an Amazon number one new release, The Ultimate Guide to Sex After Baby, Secrets to Love and Intimacy. I had the pleasure of already speaking with Deborah on another podcast years ago. I've worked with her. She is really fantastic. And this conversation is fun. It has wonderful information and it's inspiring and it just makes you want to connect and communicate with your partner. So please enjoy this because there should be sex after baby. Well, in my opinion. So before we get to that, just a few fun announcements. Things are online and they're staying online for a while. As we're here in this time of COVID-19, we don't know when we're getting back to the studio. When we do, we want it to be safe. And so we're really committed to continuing everything online. All our classes are online. We do seven days a week, live stream and re-release. And we're actually now also building a video library. So you can have an, more of an on-demand option as well. So things are building and percolating and it's kind of exciting. Um, what's really exciting is we have had a student who was with PYC for a while, and then she moved back to Japan. And now she reached out and she's like, I can come back to your classes. I never thought I could. So she's doing the re-release because there's a bit of a time difference. So how great that we're able to continue our community while we're in this time of isolation, we can still have an even bigger outreach and grow our community. So I'm super excited about that. Um, What else is going on? We just finished prenatal yoga teacher training online and we're doing again for the fall and we're actually almost full. So if you're thinking about joining our fall teacher training, please do it soon. I'd love to work with you, but we do need to limit it because we want to make sure people have plenty of time to talk and speak and and teach and we do need to limit it. So jump on that. Those that are yoga teachers out there, if you are not ready for a full training, but you want to learn, check out uh, Who's Afraid of the Pregnant Yogi. And I'm also almost done editing by me. I mean, really Ursula, the the manager who takes care of these things, editing my new online course called Teaching the Postnatal Students. So there's so many opportunities to continue your growth and your studies. I also want to say thank you for everyone who's left a rating in review. I super appreciate that. And if you're not getting our weekly emails, jump on to our website because when you join our email list, you get a downloadable, the five common pregnancy complaints and how to solve them. So I give you five of the most common pregnancy complaints and yoga asana that can help solve them. And it's kind of an easy guide. So when you sign up for our newsletter, you get that. And then every week we send out some fun tips. We talk about the podcast, um, just ways to stay in touch and continue to support you through your pregnancy and postpartum. Okay. I think I've talked enough. So let's take a super quick break and we come back. Please enjoy my conversation with Deborah Pascali Venero. Swimsuit? Check. Sunscreen? Check. Phone charger? Check. Don't forget to pack the 5-Hour Energy. It fits great in a pocket or carry-on, and the alert feeling will help you arrive ready for anything. Now get 20% off when you use code 5HETRAVEL at 5HourEnergy.com. Expires April 30th. One-time use only. Not valid with other discounts. Remember, visit 5HourEnergy.com and use code 5HETRAVEL to save 20%. Hi, Deborah. How are you today? 
I am so good. It's so such a pleasure to be here with you and everyone who's joining us. Thank you. Yeah, I know this is our second conversation. I know that the first one we did when I first started the podcast, and then we fast forward, and then I don't know if remember, remember, I did um, an advanced doula training with you, I don't know, maybe that was two or three years ago, and so it's really great to reconnect. I'm really excited. Really wonderful to reconnect, yeah. especially in these times. Yeah. Oh gosh, we all need support. So I know about you. I've known about you for years. You were the mentor to my mentor, Terry Richmond. So I've known about you for years. Why don't you tell our community a little bit about yourself and what brought you to the work that you do now? Oh, thanks, Deb, for asking. Um, I am a mother and a grandmother, a wonderful phase of my life. And really, it was through my own family births that brought me to birth. I I often think I just was born to do this because I was fascinated with birth stories as a child, um, really advocated for my own first birth. And once I gave birth, I knew that I wanted to help other people to give birth in the way that they wanted so that every person would have a positive birth, how they would define it. So I became an educator and a doula. And now I look back and I'm like, wow, I've been a doula for 34 years and have 34 years. Oh my gosh. Yes. Like really like, wow. Right. And I've taught doulas. Like, I don't even know someone the other day said, how many doulas have you trained? You know, back 34 years ago, we didn't keep digital records like mm-hmm. we do now. Um, but I've taught doulas in 40 different countries. So That's I clearly have been on this path for a long time and all different aspects from educating to training doulas to being a doula, and then really to seeing that birth is not always giving us all that it should. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been a huge advocate and part of changing models of care, both here and abroad, and created the film Orgasmic Birth, The Best Kept Secret, and co-authored the book. And really, the last 10 years for me have very much been about bringing together sexuality and sexuality of birth, a piece that I feel has been sterilized or stripped away that has really taken a, a potential away from us all of birth being healing and whole and orgasmic. And I'm guessing that's what led you to writing your book. Will you talk a little bit about what drew you to it? Yeah. So in working with so many people around the world, I love to listen to stories. And I noticed that not only was the process to having their birth, but their birth story held all these nuggets that then help them either go forward into parenting and really embrace their sexuality and have the love and intimacy and fun that they always either had or desired in their relationship. But many other people went into parenting feeling disconnected to their body, to their sexuality, and their relationships suffered. And really, that started with me. Um, My first marriage, this is the book I wish I had. In my first marriage, I made a lot of assumptions that we weren't really talking about things, but of course, we would get back to that passionate, sensuous, sexual place. And we didn't. We ended up like two ships set on sail to two different destinations because we never plotted a course that would bring us back together. Mm -hmm. So this book for me is really about the what I wished I had had that no one talked to me about developing sexuality and expanding it as a parent, as a mother. Uh, but it's also embracing just the thousands of stories that I heard and the sad fact that I wasn't alone getting a divorce with three young children, that the divorce rate is significantly higher for parents with young children. And I believe a part of it is that disconnect of intimacy, love, and sexuality. I mean, I think there's definitely, I think there also is just so many things. I was listening to a podcast, I think it was last night, um, my husband and I were cleaning up the kitchen and we were listening to kind of the divide and resentment that can happen. Um, and that right now in quarantine, 
people are really seeing the load one parent takes more than the other and then the perception and how that often has like a silent resentment. So I would, I would wonder if that has to do also with that gap. So they're missing the sensuality, the sexuality, but then as the roles get defined, there's also some, some anger. Why do you think that gap grows so much? Um, do you think they're aware of it? They're not aware of it in those first few years? I mean, I think there's all different ways. Some people are aware of it. Other people like myself are aware of it, but assume that this too shall pass. And, you know, sometimes people are blessed and it does. But I think you led on to a big piece of it. It's communication. And I think that we all have not always developed the communication skills that we need. And when we don't communicate well, when we get resentment and anger, that manifests into lack of intimacy in the bedroom, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's the chicken or the egg, but the whole aspect of communication is so vital. And, you know, prior to children, you either may or may not have good communication skills, but you also have vast amount of time to kind Mm -hmm. of work things out. When you have children, as you know, especially now in this time of COVID where you're home, your time to communicate privately with your partner is significantly decreased. And so if if your communication skills are not good, you got to get it all out in five minutes, you know, and How do you honor and hear each other and really hear each other so that when you feel seen and heard and honored, then you're going to go deeper in all other areas of your relationship. When you don't feel your partner seeing and hearing you, that's often a huge block to go deeper, especially into intimacy. Yeah. And you, in kind of skipping ahead, reading in your book that you brought up one of my favorite people who talks about vulnerability is Brene Brown. And Ah. if you're not feeling connected and you're feeling resentment, you're not going to let yourself get vulnerable. And, you know, we need that in that, in that connection, that sexual, um, connection with your partner, you have to kind of open up that way. So you're right there, the sexuality and the gap is really, is it the chicken or egg? But if we don't have that communication, that resentment, that ability to be vulnerable and open, how is one going to feel comfortable to be vulnerable and sexual? So yeah, I really, I really enjoyed diving into your book, but you also said something I want to kind of pull apart too, as we were starting to our conversation, the idea of sensuality and sexuality and pregnancy and birth. That is something I know you talked about that obviously in your book, in your movie, Orgasmic Birth. I just finished prenatal yoga teacher training. We brought this up when we were talking about Ida Mae Gaskin and the farm and, and oxytocin, but that's needed in birth and pregnancy. And yet you're right. We kind of, we take into this very sterile place. Can you, can you talk a little more about that? Yeah. I'm really glad that you're covering it in your prenatal teacher training too, because it is, for me, it's one of the big missing gaps because once you see that birth is a part of your sexuality, it's going to impact where you give birth with who you're going to give birth a lot about how you're going to prepare for birth. And it's going to change a lot, even in the moments of birth on what's available to you and what feels safe. So I think one of the first things I always have to say, especially for everyone listening is I know that sexuality has not always been safe for everyone. So really important for people that are survivors of sexual, emotional, and physical abuse. Um, My heart goes out to you, but also to really know that pregnancy is such a time to go into healing, whether it's to go deeper into healing if you've already started that process. And if you haven't, I think it's so important because as you bring your sexuality into a deeper connection, you create safety around it, respect around it. You understand yourself and your sexuality better. As you said, that kind of opening, the vulnerability that Benet Brown talks about, that's not only in your sex life, that's in birth. Mm-hmm. You can't open to birth unless every part of you opens. And although so many people think, okay, my body will open, but if you don't feel safe, if your emotions are one of fear, there's so judgment, many ways. Or shame, all of shame. that. Yeah, schedule, right. all that. It just holds us back. It stops mm-hmm. us. It blocks us. And yeah. that's why so many babies get, you know, taken out 
from us in different ways. And not that medicine doesn't have a place either. They're really valuable. So this is not about blaming and shaming. It's about the fact that we have a system that stripped away an essential element. And as we're starting to bring it back in, it's better for everyone. But if those people that are pregnant and listening, it's just such an opportunity because I always love to ask this question. You know, I say this in the book too, like, did you have really good sexual education in school? (laughs) No, (laughs) I'll be totally honest. No, you know, it's, I, I actually, I totally didn't. I read that and I thought absolutely not. But the funny thing was, so, um, now that we had to do teacher training online, I show a movie, I show, um, business of being born. So my six and eight year old were watching it with us and I'm like, well, they didn't know what I already did before. Let's talk about it now. Um, and my, my daughter was pretending that she had her, she's this little doll she carries around. She was pretending that it was in her belly. My son later asked questions. I'm like, this is fantastic. Like, let's get this out, you know, at this point, because I don't want them to not understand these things. I want them, and even though my son was around, my daughter was born, he's, I don't think he totally understood what he was seeing. But I really, yeah, you were totally hit it when you're saying that. Like, we don't have that. In fact, for a lot of people, I grew up and my mom barely explained anything to me. So I think, yeah, we have some understanding of it. We can teach our kids. It's going to make a difference on how they embrace their body. Perfect. I mean, what a great example that you're sharing. But think about like then people that are pregnant, like if you're pregnant and you've never had any of that education, then you're missing a huge gap because the same hormones of sexuality and orgasm are the same hormones of birth. And they, you know, our hormones don't say, okay, in order to have great sex, I need these conditions, but then bring me to a hospital with bright lights for strangers and I can still give birth. Telling me to push, push, push. Right. So like when we understand our sexuality in the fullest sense and have really good education around it, then it gives a whole new lens and light to birth and people make different choices and that creates different outcomes. Mm -hmm. And they also, I feel like if, if you have that kind of freedom of sexuality in your private life, when then you know how to listen to your body, you know how your body wants to move and that can relate a lot to birth as well like trusting how your body wants to move, not being concerned with the sounds you're making. I feel there's such a, such a a parallel line I see between sex and birth. Oh, totally. I mean, does Anna Mae Gaskin says, you know, in our film, when a woman's well cared for, she sounds like she's having great sex, right? In labor. And as you said, the sounds are there, we move. And just when we feel really connected to our body and our sexuality, no one's going to take your power away. I often say to people, you know, there's power in birth and there's no neutral. You either claim it or you give it away. Mm And too often fear has us put the power in someone else. But when we feel really whole and, you know, sexuality is an essential aspect of who we are. So we have to be whole in every area. Then we're going to step into that power in a different way. And in birth, not be intimidated or not allow ourselves to let anyone else make us feel like, you know, we don't know what's best for our body. Yes, I 100% agree. So as I was going through your book, I was taking some notes. So can you explain, there was one acronym, and I like how you really, really hit it in the book, but can you explain your acronym PLEASURES? Yes. So, you know, when you're writing a book, it's always fun to say, how can I bring this across kind of in the simplest way, right? And I thought, oh, well, it's all about pleasure for me. That for me is like what helps us every day. And the more challenging the day, the more we need our pleasures to take us from a state of stress to a state of calm and connection. And so I thought, well, let me use this acronym of pleasures because what we're really doing after having a baby is developing, I call it my pleasures treasures chest, right? So that you all have a toolkit that follows a format of steps, but is personalized because we're each different and we each have different 
pleasures and treasures that are going to be essential components of how we develop our relationship and our sexuality. So I used each letter of pleasures, like beginning, we're just preparing kind of that roadmap. And each of the the letters takes us through an element from preparing to connecting to our bodies, to going deeper into communication. But of course, the letters are a little bit not exact with (laughs) what I'm saying now. So I'm going to leave that for people that have to read. But the (laughs) elements are really preparing your roadmap, connecting to your body. Your birth holds um, a huge story for you. And it's an opportunity to really say, did everything in my birth serve me? And I want to bring it forward. What in my birth do I need to heal? Um, And sensuality, how we take in on all our different senses. And then, boy, and I'm sure you had fun because I had fun writing the chapter all about sexuality and the stories that we got. I have to say, I went, whoa, Um, so great to have so many people really give honest accounts of different types of orgasm and different ways that they were intimate and feel sexy. And that final S is to really celebrate um, that you've expanded your sexuality toolkit and hopefully you feel sexy, wild, and ready to just bring this fullness of yourself, not only to yourself, but to your relationship and to your parenting. I really like that. I want to pull on something you just said that kind of pulled my ears. Can you talk about how one's birth story may affect their sexuality post-birth? Because I can imagine as, you know, I haven't done nearly the births you've done. I only, you've probably done thousands. I've done like a mere hundred, but I, I watched people experience it and it's really been a wild ride. I've seen literally the orgasmic birth from two people. And then I've seen traumatic births and Mm -hmm. there's a couple that still ring in my head that I can imagine. I never really dove deep into it with them after. I didn't think it was my place, but I can imagine that birth trauma affecting their life post-birth. Um, and then, of course, on the other side, someone could have had this you know, orgasmic experience and maybe they felt that they really found their power. So, so it can go very, you know, and everything along that bell-shaped curve. So can you talk a little bit about how one's birth story might affect sexuality post-birth? Yeah. And as you said, it's so individual, but it does seem to fall into categories that when you do have birth trauma, um, it is so much harder to feel in connection with your body. That trauma often can be deep seated. And for many people requires a real period of introspection, maybe even a professional therapist to work with them to healing. The good news is healing is always possible. The bad news is a day that I know should be orgasmic for every person is becoming traumatic for far too many people. And this is a tragedy I feel we all should be raising our voice to. It just shouldn't be able to happen. Um, So birth trauma really needs to be taken seriously. People that have their body cut without their permission or are talked to and disrespected in many ways, we take in, we're very sensitive when we're giving birth. And the way that people make us feel gets ingrained in us. So if we feel supported and respected and honored, we've actually shown on self-esteem that people's self-esteem grows. And the day after birth, they feel stronger in who they are. And the opposite is sadly true. So we know with birth trauma, there can be a lowering, almost a shaming um, that can be internalized into the body and affect sexuality as well. So birth for me is a huge pivot moment. It's a for some people, that their sexuality has not been all that they hoped for. And then in birth, they were able to allow themselves to open to this fullest amount to really experience their body in this new and powerful way, to own their voice and their sensations. They'll tell me that the best orgasms of their life came after birth. One woman said, like, now that my partner's seen every bit of me (laughs) in this open way, I didn't hold back anymore. And so 
this ability to see yourself in this new opening is truly glorious. But if you see yourself in less than, sadly, that can actually impair us being able to feel safe and to fully open to our sexuality postpartum. Mm. And I, I just want to comment that I loved what you said about the trauma and how it really impacts. That's actually what really drives me to do the work I do is knowing how many people come out of birth traumatized and then what that does to their path into parenthood. It just, it just puts a huge, you know, rock on their shoulders to have to carry that forward. So I'm, I'm really appreciative that you even talked about that because the numbers of, and that's not, we won't get into a whole thing about that, but the numbers of people that come out of birth traumatized is, is enormous and overwhelming and something that I know all of us in the birth world are really trying to trying to tamper down because we don't want people to have that. That's something they carry with them for, for a long time. And you're right. And it goes right into their sexual life because how can they feel open and vulnerable and, and proud of their body or embrace it if they, if they're so traumatized. So thank you. I really appreciate that. But that also pivots me into this whole motherhood thing and sexuality. So I don't know. Yes. So, so, okay, let me, let's go there. Cause I was laughing as I was reading this because a couple weeks ago was mother's day. So I was watching at night, my husband and I were watching a Saturday night live rerun of just like the motherhood one. And yes. maybe you've seen this, this commercial, they have it. It's a Saturday night live commercial, the mom jeans where, yes. <laughs> so as I was reading your book, I'm like, Oh my God. I, just, and I had just seen it a few weeks ago. So those that don't know, take a pause from this podcast, go look it up. The mom jeans where they're like, where are others lose all their sexuality. Like there's this thing that, and there's some truth to it, you know, like motherhood, maybe it's the whole, um, virgin mother. I don't know, but there's this whole disconnect between motherhood and sexuality when you wouldn't be a mother without something and sexual. Um, so can you, and then you talk about it in your book, which is great. Can you, why do you think people put sexuality and motherhood into very different realms? Why can't we have a, a sexy mama? Yeah. And I mean, hopefully it's changing some, and I give some credit to, especially since we're influenced by media, not only the comedy of Saturday Night Live doing that to say how ridiculous it is, but um, also the celebrities that are speaking out, you know, Beyonce saying when she, after she had a baby, like, I'm sexy, and she did a whole sexy mama thing. But I think that society, for the last 500 years, we've be- really been in a more patriarchal model. And I'm not saying that as gender, but as philosophy and different religions and cultures have really kind of almost gave us beliefs, the fact that we didn't have good sex education in school or that our parents didn't talk about it. There was this kind of shame around sexuality in many ways, and then especially about motherhood and sex, kind of the Madonna whore thing, that once you're a mother, you're no longer sexy. Even television, you know, if you're young and single, you can be sexy, but you're a mother now. Um, You have to change that perception. And I really feel that's something that every person listening, I hope every person that reads our book, unpacks where that comes from for them. You know, really looks at what is your belief around motherhood in sexuality, where does it come from? And if you're, if what you desire of what you'd like for sexuality for yourself as a parent is not there, then what are three action steps that you can take to get there? Because I think it's loaded for all of us in all different ways. What do you think there are some steps, like just step back and think, how can I still be sexy and a mother? What are your, what are some, I love that you said three action steps. Can you give some examples of what you mean by that? Yeah, I think sometimes it's just first to give voice that you even have a barrier. Like some people haven't really talked about it or never said it out loud or never wrote it down if you're journaling along with this, but the first action step is to identify what is your belief about motherhood and sexuality. And if you feel that there's been any shame or stifling around it, just name it. Where did it come from? Um, and, and that the second I would really say is to put an action step of what do you want to do about it? What would you like to do to feel that you're a sexy mama? Um, and we all define that differently. What does that mean? And the third is really communicate, especially if you're in a relationship with a partner, 
partner, I think that's where communication comes in because I find sometimes one partner is clearly seeing you as absolutely sexy. I've been really blown away, especially in a lot of the exercises we're doing in our online class where the person that's given birth will write how they're feeling about their body or they're feeling about their sexuality. And then we ask the other partner to write about how they feel about your body and how they feel about sexuality. And they're completely opposite. And like the, the woman had no clue that her partner was still seeing her as sexy, that the, the disconnect was her own. Like, where does that disconnect from come from? And sometimes it's the other way. I mean, I'm honest in my book that part of the what really was an issue for me in my first marriage was that my partner was the one that had the more longstanding belief that you're a mother and sexuality didn't quite go together in the same way anymore. And we didn't take the time to unpack that and communicate about it and look at it and heal it. Mm. I'm going to jump to some of my notes further down because you totally hit something. You talked about also kind of that postpartum body that the, the person that gave birth, maybe they don't feel sexy, but their partner still sees them. So can we, first of all, I, I really appreciated that chapter about the, the new, the, what they call the new body chapter. And I'm going to admit that it took me a while. I'm, I'm still not a hundred percent there to really appreciate my, and my son is eight, my daughter is six. So we're still, we're still on a journey. Um, so, <laughs> still on it. a journey. So can you talk about that and how to appreciate your postpartum body? Yeah, this is such an issue, right? Is that one, we don't talk about it when we're pregnant. I don't know about you, but I remember thinking like, I was so focused on giving birth that no one talked to me about what my body was going to look like. And I was pretty shocked after my first, like, I, I couldn't believe what my body looked like. And so I think we need to normalize bodies. We need to see postpartum bodies. We shouldn't be hiding them so that all women, um, all people know kind of this journey. But the second thing that I find in so many people is we're trying to get back to something. And like when you're trying to get back, that means you're not appreciating where you are. And so many people are like, well, I'm going to eventually get back that body. But I want to just say to you, like, you're never going to get back that body. Your no. body has changed because you gave birth. Because you and... created a person or multiple people. Like what my, my midwife right. said, she's like, the landscape of your pelvis is forever changed. I'm like, that is so true. <laughs> Isn't it? And like, I remember looking down and going, where did these stretch marks come from? Like, I truly hadn't seen them at the end of pregnancy. And like, those are the roadmaps to motherhood for me. Like, I wear them proudly on my body now with pride um, that my body gave birth rather than shame that I have these stretch marks. They're no longer, of course, red, but they're little fine silver lines. And, And so I think that we have to look at that you're not going to go back, but how can we accept where we are? And as you know, in the book, I have people write love letters and to their bodies to look in the mirror and say, I love you. And I think the most incredible has been to have partners um, either tell or write their love letter about what they love about your body. And can I tell you in our circles, when we're in our class together, the tears we all have when people have permission to share what their partner said or wrote is incredible. And I think we don't realize that, right? Like we're judging our own body and we're not even realizing that our partner's are not near as critical and usually loving that body. And that will help us also really love our body because it's essential. If you feel shame and you don't feel comfortable in your body, it's impacting your sexuality. Yeah. I definitely know that my husband appreciates what I look like far more than I do. Like he's actually said that straight out. Like when I'm judgeful or anything, he, he doesn't see it. And that helps. I actually find that helps me. Um, you know, I, I don't know, I find more confidence from that. So maybe that will help some of our, our listeners out there as well. I want to talk a little bit about co-parenting. So what are some of your strategies for co-parenting and putting your efforts into being a good parent while also maintaining that connection to your partner? Cause like you were saying in your first marriage, like two ships kind of just going side by side or crossing. So how can we maintain still being co-parents 
as well as connecting partners because they're very different experiences or jobs. Like you have to co-parent and communicate there, but sometimes you can lose that connection as partners. Is that just back to communication? I would say that's when when you were asking that question, I'm like, I hear communication, right? And the fact that, you know, we can have two different roles and we might interact in those roles differently, but it's both of them is about communication. What are kind of those boundaries that feel safe and important in in co-parenting? And then what are the boundaries around intimacy um, and love and making the time for each of them? I think sometimes, obviously, co-parenting is such a huge, huge, huge part of our life that then we get lost in setting aside that it's equally important to make the time to communicate about intimate aspects and make the time for intimacy, even if they're just short periods every day, especially when babies are young, um, five minutes a day to have five minutes of love and intimacy, I think is essential. And I say this in the book, right? Like we wouldn't go a day without liquid, without water. And yet how have we stopped valuing connection, intimacy, and love? I don't think you should allow yourself to go a day without that either. Mm, I like that. All right, I, we're going to take a quick break. When I come back, I am going to ask you about, since you were talking about um, intimacy and finding time every day, just throwing this out there, you can think about it during our break, of even having new parents finding the time <laughs> to connect. Sometimes doesn't it feel like you have to schedule things. So let's take a super quick break. When we come back, we're going to talk about how you even make sure you give each other time to connect. We'll be right back. This podcast is sponsored by Skylight Calendar. Let's be real. Running a household can be exhausting and chaotic. And finding the perfect Mother's Day gift, it's not exactly a no-brainer. Until now. The Skylight Calendar is the best way to organize the family and give everyone, especially mom, some peace of mind to enjoy the things that matter most. The Skylight Calendar is a smart, touchscreen calendar that keeps track of and manages the chores, dinner planning, groceries, and to-dos for the whole family. The Skylight Calendar automatically syncs each family member's digital calendars and displays them all together on one color-coded touchscreen. It even doubles as a digital picture frame so you can finally share all those special moments that are just sitting on your phone. As a limited time offer for our listeners, get 15% off your purchase of a Skylight Calendar when you go to skylightcal.com slash easy. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-C-A-L dot com slash easy. Get 15% off your Mother's Day purchase now at skylightcal.com slash easy. With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. <gasps> no, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Okay, we are back. So I know when my first was born and then my second, they were pretty close in age. It was really hard to find the time to connect. You say like five minutes a day, but how do you get even more of that time? Any, any suggestions? Yeah. I think for a lot of people with young children, especially like you, when they're, when they're close together, or some people have even more that are close together is, is picking a time. Like if you have to set the alarm and get up five minutes earlier, or even if you're exhausted at night and I know it's like so tempting to just pass out, but like five minutes to just even tell each other, um, how you love each other or five minutes to hold each other or touch or whatever it is. That's your point of connection. One person in our book wrote that just why she's breastfeeding, right? They make sure that some body part is touching if they're in bed, whether it's their feet or their hands. Like, I think there are ways we're so used to thinking, okay, we need like 30 minutes, right? For whatever. But I just say, start breaking it down into the little things. Like, have you, you know, touched or hugged for at least a minute or more a few times a day? And we know that oxytocin production goes up when we hug and we really hold, not that kind of fleeting, like, hi, but that kind of, let me just hold you. Let me just look into your eyes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Let me feel you. And I think no matter how busy you are with children, um, you still need to find those points of connection. And once you start, when you first start doing it, you're exhausted, right? But what it will do is give you energy. It'll calm your stress. It'll bring up your oxytocin hormones. And it becomes self-fulfilling that when you can develop these small habits, they will expand into bigger periods of time and more love and connection and Ultimately, that's what we all desire, right? With our relationships and our partners, we're going to be better co-parents if we're really expressing our love rather than just coexisting and potentially allowing resentment to get in there. Mm, yeah. It all comes back to communication. Um, there was something else I have again, all these little notes from your book. There's one part that I just wrote. Yes, 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 yes. It was about the, <laughs> <laughs> you should see that it's all marked up. I know. I love it. <laughs> Um, this is why I can't have things on Kindle because I need to like write and notate and (laughs) I'm a paper girl that way. All right. So the one thing I love, you call them pleasure breaks. I loved it because I completely related to that. And so, especially now during quarantine where we're all together all the time and there's very little downtime when I saw that I'm like, Oh, I know what she's talking about. So I'm going to share my little pleasure break. It is after dinner and people might think a little wacky that this is my pleasure break, but, um, my husband, I, I'm the one that cleans up because I actually am a little neurotic. I get really clean after the kitchen, the dining room, all that. And my husband takes the kids upstairs or they're watching TV, having their treat. And I turn on Pandora and I'm a show tunes girl. And I literally have my show tunes on. It also probably helps. I've had a glass of wine by this point too. And I am just dancing and singing. And it's maybe 10 minutes of this, but it is, it just picks me up. I just, at the end of the day, I am just having a grand old time in their cleaning. So I read that I'm like, Oh, those are my pleasure breaks. Cause there's so few breaks during the day. Um, and it's like a ritual. So I would love for you to talk a little more about other, what you've heard from others. Cause that just resonated with me. Yeah. And I love that. And I have to say, one, I'd love to see that. That sounds like a great little video, right? You've oh, got to YouTube that one. But I think a lot of people, I, I do hear a lot of people, it's it's related somehow to music, dance, song. It's like creativity. It's some aspect that kind of frees ourselves from what's ordinary, right? And take that little pleasure break. But for many, it also can be meditation, yoga, a walk, Um, a cup of tea, a warm bath with aromatherapy. Um, People find all different ways. And the great thing like you did, and I love that you said, Deb, that it's also a ritual. And so I think that's fantastic when we can have rituals that are daily bring us to pleasure. And whether it's now during COVID and the stress, but you know, we've all had different moments in life that are stressful. And so often people think that in stress, they don't, they can't reach pleasure. And when we realize that it only has to be three, five, or in your case, 10 minutes, if again, we can break it into nuggets, we can significantly shift things if we have our list of three to five pleasures that we could do every day. Mm, yes. So uh, maybe I will get that video out. Although I'm sure my neighbors might have a video of me dancing. Um, but yeah, I love that. <laughs> in fact, they're going to probably someday bribe me with it. Um, but... I'd love to see it. <laughs> Yeah. Big old fan kicks. All sorts of things are happening. (laughs) So also in your book, again, bear with me as I go through some of the notes, because these are the little nuggets I really enjoyed. You talk about finding that sexy, wild inner woman. Can you give a little bit more about ways someone can find that? Yeah. And, you know, one of the things we did in the chapter before is talk about all the different types of female orgasm. And one of the things I've found in working with um, women is, again, we not every woman is aware that there are so many different ways to orgasm, to really understanding our body. The clitoris is 8,000 nerve endings. Yeah, so I didn't know that when I read that. I was like, sure. go us. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and these are the things. So like, I love to work with people and literally show them 
a lot of people aren't even familiar totally with their anatomy and really understanding it and seeing, looking in the mirror, seeing your body, touching all aspects of it, um, healing what needs to be healed if it doesn't feel safe to do that first so that you go slowly and create the safe space. So what I'm finding in working with women that are really understanding those 8,000 nerves um, and able to explore them in different ways and find all different avenues of pleasure, that then when they've healed their birth story or taken on their birth story, because this is coming at the end of doing all these other steps and they have their daily pleasures and they're communicating well and they're feeling really whole and good in their body. This all comes together. And I mean, truly in my recent group that we just had like a group meeting, they were at the last class. So they were in the sexy wild woman. So we've completed all the steps and the stories that they told that of the best sex of their life, all of them had just had some of the best sex of their life. And there wasn't like something we had to do to, to be the sexy wild woman. They were it now because they had done all those pleasure steps and they just were ready to celebrate. So I want to say it is the completion of the process. I don't think you can just plug in at the very end without having approached Mm -hmm. all the other pieces and integrated them. But once you're there, no one's going to take that away from you. Mm, That's so great. Is there anything before we take another break and I start to ask you about some last minute tips or piece of advice for new expectant parents, is there anything that I haven't touched on from your book or just from your experience that you want to share? Um, I would say the the main thing in this message that I want to share is just that every person has the potential of an incredible sexuality, incredible connection, and multiple orgasms in all different ways. So I hope every person that's listening really explores for themselves where they are. Look at what you've been told, what you'd like and know that you can get there. Mm, that is so important. All right, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, now you have, would you say, 34 years of experience working with new and expectant parents. So from all that knowledge, I'm going to ask you for one tip or piece of advice you'd like to offer new and expectant parents. We'll be right back. This podcast is sponsored by Skylight Calendar. Let's be real. Running a household can be exhausting and chaotic. And finding the perfect Mother's Day gift It's not exactly a no-brainer. Until now, the Skylight Calendar is the best way to organize the family and give everyone, especially mom, some peace of mind to enjoy the things that matter most. The Skylight Calendar is a smart, touchscreen calendar that keeps track of and manages the chores, dinner planning, groceries, and to-dos for the whole family. The Skylight Calendar automatically syncs each family member's digital calendars and displays them all together on one color-coded touchscreen. It even doubles as a digital picture frame, so you can finally share all those special moments that are just sitting on your phone. As a limited time offer for our listeners, get 15% off your purchase of a Skylight Calendar when you go to skylightcal.com slash easy. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-C-A-L dot com slash easy. Get 15% off your Mother's Day purchase now at skylightcal.com slash easy. Okay, we're back. So I'm, I'm very excited to hear what you think it is because you have really explored birth and pregnancy and postpartum and motherhood in, in such a wide way. So what one tip or piece of advice have you pulled out to share? So I would say I have to say, explore your sexuality and know that you can have a gentler, easier birth when you are turned on. When you turn on your hormones of pleasure and sexuality, they're the same hormones of birth. So I truly would encourage people, whether that's you know, kissing and touch or nipple stimulation or masturbation or a vibrator. Um, There are just so many ways to turn on because when your body's turned on, what does it do? It gets juicy and it opens. Mm. And that's what we want to do in birth. And I think by not connecting birth and sexuality, too many people are giving birth where their body is like saying, not now. I'm like closed, you know, and we're having to suck and cut babies out. So connect sexuality and birth and look through that lens and see what would you do differently. 
Oh, I've so enjoyed this conversation. I really have. And I hope that I hope that so many other people have too. Where can people find your work? Because it's fast and it's important. Oh, thank you. It's easy. Orgasmicbirth.com or Orgasmic Birth on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter. But if you come to orgasmicbirth.com, from there you can access our new book, The Ultimate Guide to Sex After Baby, our new classes, and engage with me in many ways. Oh, you are brilliant and just such a delight. And I'm just so happy I've had the chance to uh, have several conversations with you and work with you. You're just, you're just wonderful. So those, and for the community out there, if you're a new expectant parent, definitely take a look at Deborah's work. But also if you're someone thinking about the birth world and you're like, Ooh, should I be a doula or not? Deborah will be an amazing guide for you. So check out all Aww. of her training. Well, you're, you're just great. So I'm Thank very you. appreciative. Thanks, Deb. I so appreciate that. <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And whoever's listening, wishing you pleasure today and in birth and postpartum. <laughs> Take Thanks care. so much. You're welcome. Bye. This has been an episode of Yoga Birth Babies, produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. You can catch us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Thanks for listening. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Chumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. The Chumba life is for everybody. So go to Chumbacasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.